We've seen trauma, we've discovered resilience, and now we're looking to identify that mission objective, that change we desire to create, to understand a bit the physics of change and making true movements happen. It certainly could be at the national or international level. This could also be for your company, your organization, perhaps your families, yourself. And I uh, was inspired to meet earlier this year in a, I think a webinar or something that we were both on. And I said, this guy's got something going on and I wanna meet him. And so we did, we even went down to Philadelphia, my family and I, and we sat down and had dinner. And I said, would you come and share the physics of change? And he said, sure. Uh, this, by the way, is his picture from Ukraine, Orange Revolution. He'll tell you about it, Greg Sattel. I still remember the first time I truly understood the power of change. I'll never forget it. It was in the fall of 2004, and I awoke early one Saturday morning in Kyiv, Ukraine. And I was surprised to find that my fiance, who's not normally an early riser, was already awake, fully dressed, and quietly heading towards the door. Now put yourself in my position. I figured I must have done something wrong, but I didn't know what it was. Was she angry with me? Was she leaving me? Or maybe she was just hungry and running out for a bite to eat. I didn't know. So I asked her, where are you going? And she said, oh, I'm heading out to the demonstration. And I said, but I thought you didn't care about politics. Well, you know, I didn't, she said. But it's enough, and we have to do something about it. And just like that, like somebody somewhere flipped a switch, the entire country seemed to change overnight. And everybody we knew was going out to political demonstrations on a regular basis. And that's what led just a few months later to what we now know as the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. You ever have something you just felt so passionately about, but you knew the deck was stacked against you, and for years or even decades, to hope just seemed to invite further disappointment. And then, for a moment, the universe opens up and you can glimpse the possibility that you can make a difference, not just argue a point. The, revo the Orange Revolution was a moment just like that, and we were able to change the course of history. What I remember most is how I had a fairly unique perspective. In my, as a foreigner, many would consider me something less than a full participant, but in my role leading the country's uh, leading news organization, I was certainly something more than a casual bystander. And what I, what I remember most was this feeling of profound confusion. Nobody really knew what was going on or what would happen next. Not the journalists I would speak to in the newsroom every day, not the other business leaders, certainly not the political leaders. Nobody with any conventional form of power had any ability to shape events at all. There was just this mysterious force that no one could define, but no one could deny that was moving events along. And I was amazed at how thousands upon thousands of people who'd ordinarily be doing very different things would all of a sudden stop what they were doing and start doing the same thing in nearly perfect unison. And I thought to myself, I'd like to bottle that force. I'd like to understand it and put it to some useful purpose. 
And that's what set me out on my journey. It led to my book, Cascades. And what I discovered was, is there are natural laws that govern change. And these laws can be learned and applied by anyone in any context, business, social, government, education, you name it. So today, I want to share five of those laws with you. The first one is the status quo always has inertia on its side and never yields its power gracefully. The biggest misconception about change is that once people understand it, they will embrace it. That's almost never true. If you seek to make genuine impact, there are people who will hate your idea. Not for any rational logic necessarily, but because for whatever reason, it offends their dignity, their identity, their sense of self. Anytime you ask people to change what they think or what they do, some will seek to undermine you in ways that are dishonest and underhanded and deceptive. Once you internalize that, you're ready to move forward. The second law is that small groups loosely connected but united by a shared purpose are what drive transformational change. One of the first things I learned along my journey is that scientists had known for centuries about that mysterious force I encountered on the streets of Kyiv. And they even had a name for it. It's called a network cascade or a viral cascade. Imagine hundreds of thousands of protesters flooding the streets of Kyiv or Cairo or Washington, D.C. Countless fireflies blinking in the night sky in nearly perfect unison. Sports fans doing the wave at a stadium. These are all examples of information cascading through a network. When individuals or small groups hold an idea, they're negligible. But when those groups connect and synchronize their collective behavior, they can become immensely powerful. An industry is remade, a country overthrown, the previous order is transcended, and the world is transformed. As leaders, it's our job to help those groups to connect and to inspire them with purpose. The third law is that revolutions don't begin with a slogan, they begin with a cause. When we look back at transformational icons, their paths often seem inevitable. Of course, they were able to change the world. I mean, they were superhuman people. But they didn't start out that way. Gandhi, as a young lawyer, was so shy he could hardly speak up in open court. Nelson Mandela started out as an angry black nationalist. Steve Jobs was a college dropout. What set them on their paths was each one of them came across a problem they just couldn't look away from. For Gandhi, it was a humiliation he faced on a train. For Mandela, it was the fundamental injustice of apartheid. For Steve Jobs, it was products that sucked. Computers sucked. Music players sucked. Mobile phones sucked. It's because things that sucked so offended his sensibilities, he felt compelled to make them insanely great. If you want to create change in this world, you need to identify a grievance that people actually care about. Because if they don't see a problem, they're not gonna bet on your solution. Doesn't matter whether it's in your team, your organization, your industry, your community, or throughout society as a whole. Change isn't about ideas. It's about solving meaningful problems. Fourth law is that your targets determine your tactics. When we believe in change, we want to act. We want to hit the streets, argue against injustice, start a business, make things happen, get stuff done. But without a sound strategy, 
We're just wasting our time. To be effective, we need to mobilize people to influence institutions. We're always mobilizing somebody to influence something. Those are the two questions we need to ask about each and every action we plan to take. Who are we mobilizing and to influence what? To truly change the world, we need to learn to see it differently. We can't just fight the same old losing battles over and over again. We need to learn to reframe our struggle in terms that allow us to bring relative strength to bear against relative weakness and to tilt the playing field to our advantage. The fifth, and in some ways most important law, is that every revolution inspires its own counter-revolution. That's what we failed to understand in Kyiv almost 20 years ago. In 2004, we took to the streets and seemingly against all odds, we won. Or so we thought. The people who opposed our cause, the ones who wanted to undermine it any way they could, in ways that are dishonest and underhanded and deceptive, they didn't just melt away and go home because we thought we'd won. No, they redoubled their efforts and eventually they were able to reverse what we had achieved. So you can never bet your revolution on any particular person or technology or policy. It needs to be rooted in shared values. That's what we got wrong. The Orange Revolution got its name because orange was the campaign color of the opposition candidate, Viktor Yushchenko. But when he got into office, turns out he wasn't a god or a magician. He was just a man. And when he failed, the movement did too. In the next Ukrainian revolution, the one that came a decade later, they were smarter and they did it right. The protests were called Euro Maidan because they were rooted in values, specifically European values. It was in so many ways a revolution of dignity. And it continues even now as Ukraine is being tested as few countries ever have. Even under the greatest of strains, dignity is prevailing. So I want to leave you with a question, or a challenge, really. Do you want to make a point or to make a difference? One of the toughest things about leading change is we need to allow others to embrace it for their own reasons, which might be different than ours. When we believe in something passionately. We want others to see it how we do, with all its beautiful complexity and nuance. We want them to share our passion and our fervor. But if we're truly committed to change, we need to hold ourselves accountable to be effective messengers. We can't just preach to the choir. We need to venture out of the church and mix with the heathens. We can be clear about where we stand and still listen to others who see it differently. Eat. That doesn't mean we compromise. We should never compromise on values we believe in. But what it does mean is that we need to identify common ground upon which to build a shared future. Each and every one of you have the power to do that. So my message to you today is, don't worry about making a point. Go out and make a real difference. Thank you. Greg, that was fantastic. You did more than make a point. You made a difference. <laughs>